Well, I appreciate that. I'm always thankful for the opportunity to preach the gospel of Christ. And I'm thankful that tonight we are looking at the future of both families. And while we may not know what the future holds, we do know who holds the future. And we could consider trends and possibilities and what could happen in the future, and we might be close to right. But that is not the purpose of this lecture. What we want to study is what can we do that we might affect the future in a good way for the church and for the home by our words and by our deeds. We want to do all that we can to help both families to be able to look confidently to the future, even beyond time into eternity. And so let us consider the family, the church. Romans 16, 16, Paul wrote about the churches of Christ. The churches of Christ salute you. Not some ecumenical conglomeration of denominations, but different congregations in different locations. And while the church may refer to the church universal, it may also refer to a local congregation such as this one is. The church is that group of baptized believers, Mark 16, 15, and 16, those who have believed and have been baptized. It is that group of baptized believers who have been called out of the world by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, and have been called into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, being baptized into Christ as the gospel teaches that we are to do. And so the church is that group of baptized believers called out of the world by the gospel, called into Christ, and over which Christ is head, Colossians 1.18. He is the head of the body, the church. This church, this God-given church, is the family of God. Paul wrote, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. That word house is a word that literally means the dwelling place, but here it's used metaphorically to emphasize those who are in that dwelling place. That is, those who are the house or the household, that is the family of God. And so the family of God is that group of people who are, because of their being baptized believers, coming out of the world, coming into Christ, they are the saved. And Acts 2.47 tells us the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. It is the case then that all who are saved are in the church. And I'm not ashamed to tell people that because it's the truth. And those who are in the church then are those who've been saved. If one hasn't been saved, he's not in the church. And if one's not in the church, he's not saved. So every accountable person who has been saved, has been added to the Lord's church. And if one is not in that church, he is outside of Christ. And as Ephesians 2.12 tells us, he is without hope. And there is nothing that can take place in the future that is going to change that truth. If this world continues another 10,000 years, it will still be true that one must hear the gospel believe it and obey it that he might have the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ applied to his soul that it might wash away his sins, Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, Revelation 1, 5, and that he might be saved by it. It will still be the case that the saved are in the church, that is the church of Christ, the body of Christ of which he is the head. And there is nothing that is going to change that. So Christ said he would build his church, and he did. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. Acts 2 shows the beginning, the establishment of the church there in Jerusalem on Pentecost Day. It is that church that is the one for, he, for which he paid the price, Acts 20, 28. He paid it with his own blood. It is the one that he loved and for which he gave himself, Ephesians 5, 25. And there is no other religious body for which Christ died 
but he did die for his church. In God's plan, the future of the church was determined in the distant past. He determined before the foundation of the world that the church would come to be, that it would be the church of his son, that it would be the church of the saved. And the existence, the importance, and the influence of the church were determined long, long ago. Great prophet Daniel, the prophet of the court there in Babylon, told Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the king of the world empire, concerning the dream he had had about the great image of that fourth empire that would come, that fourth worldly kingdom that would come. And Daniel said, in the days of these kings, that is the Roman kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. He's going to establish a kingdom. It will never be destroyed. It will not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This was hundreds of years before the church came into existence on that Pentecost day, Acts 2. But God, he said, would establish a kingdom. That kingdom we know is the church, Matthew 16, 16 and following. Jesus said he would build his church and he said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. The kingdom is the church, Colossians 1, 13. To the church at Colossae, Paul wrote, he said that they had been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Thus the kingdom had to exist and this in the middle of the first century. And then John wrote that he was in the kingdom, Revelation 1-7. Couldn't be in a kingdom if it were not existent, Revelation 1-9. And so the church that Christ built will stand, it will continue, but the future of the local congregation very much depends upon what we do today and what we do in the future. And it may depend upon what somebody did 20 years ago. A sound congregation may exist today, and our hope and our prayer is that it will grow and prosper, but it is not always the case that that is what happens. A sound congregation today may not be sound some years down the road. It may be that they become complacent, they quit evangelizing. It may be they follow the way of a false teacher. They lose their way. It may be that an unfaithful eldership leads them astray. It may be that they decline and that congregation is lost. Or it may even go into apostasy. And so what a sad future that is. And how each one of us needs to look into the mirror at home and ask ourselves this question, what am I doing to ensure a bright future for the church? What am I doing to make sure that the local congregation where I am is going to continue to be a beacon of light in a dark world? What am I doing? Let me tell you a sad story. Congregation... More than 300 in attendance back in the 70s. There in the very heart of town, it had flourished in an area where people from the country had come into the city and they'd bought homes and they'd built houses and they had reared their children. They were good people, honest people, hardworking people. They brought their children up to believe in God and to be honest too. And so the church grew, but over time it changed. Those people moved away. They died. The children didn't want to live there. They moved out. And so the community changed. It didn't change for the better. And the congregation suffered. It tried, tried and tried to reach those, but they were more interested in worldly things than spiritual things. And so we got a call one day, and a brother said, We've sold the building. They wanted to make a contribution to the school, and while we're happy to receive contributions, that is not the way. We'd much rather that church continue to grow and be a, a force for good, but it's not there anymore. 
And so when we think about the future of the church, what will it be? Will it be a dilapidated building with a sign hanging on one hook where it used to say, the Church of Christ? Let's think about the family. Just as God had a plan for the church, He had a plan for the home. And man's home, his family, was the cultivating uh, creative act of God's work, Genesis 1 and 2. God created man in His own image. And He looked upon His creation and He said, Behold, it was very good, Genesis 1, 26 through 31. But Adam was alone. He said, It's not good for man to be alone, Genesis 2, 18. So He brought before Adam every living creature and He looked at all of them. There was not found a suitable helper. And so God caused Adam to have a deep sleep and took from his side a rib and formed from that rib Eve and and brought her to him. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Genesis 2, 21 through 23. And Genesis 5, 1 and 2 tells us that he made them male and female and he called their name Adam. And so God instituted the home. He made man and woman for each other. And his law on marriage is, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. And so God placed within the bounds of marriage that marital relationship. And from that, the birth and the rearing of children. And God gave certain boundaries, certain parameters for marriage, that there would be one man and one woman, each of which is uh, eligible to marry according to God's law and according to the laws of the land. And God didn't make any other arrangement. He didn't allow and does not allow any other arrangement. And He does not do so today. And it doesn't matter what society may think about marriage and the home. God's plan is still His plan. His law is still His law. And it will be when the Lord comes back. He's not made any exceptions to that concerning who may marry one man and one woman. I don't know, and I'm I'm not making a law for you, certainly. But I can tell you what I've been doing lately. When a television program comes on, and I don't watch many things, uh, sports and uh, car shows maybe, but even then, when a television program comes on and they are glorifying immorality, especially now as they're pushing homosexuality upon us, they're going to force us to condone it, to agree that it's okay, that it's a loving and nurturing relationship, and there's nothing wrong with it. Whenever they do that, I'd watch something else. And I'm probably not going to watch that program again. And when the commercial comes on, and it is showing there are two women who are holding each other and exchanging cards because they love each other. And and I'm not talking about some kind of sisterly love, but that love that is confined to marriage. I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to find somebody else from whom I'm going to buy my birthday cards. I may just make them myself and save $6. I wrote to a president of a well-known department store, large chain. And I'd been going to that department store all my life. I remember as a little bitty fellow, my mom would give me $5. This tells how old I am. She'd give me $5, and I'd go to that store, and she'd let me pick out two shirts and two pairs of pants and some socks. And if I had a little money left over, maybe something else. Been shopping at that store all my life. Spent thousands and thousands of dollars there. It was one of my favorite places to go. And I got their Mother's Day catalog a few years ago, and there's a woman and another woman and a child. And that was the family. Happy Mother's Day. Well, I didn't like that at all. I was thinking about it and pondering what to do, and then a few weeks later I got their Father's Day catalog, and there's a man and another man and a child, and that's the family. Happy Father's Day. So I wrote the president, and I said, I've spent a lot of money in your store, been going to it for decades. I'll never step foot in one again. And I decided not to do that, and I have not, and I will not. That's what I'm doing. I'm not saying that's what you have to do, 
but I'm tired of this. God has told us what He wants in marriage and what He allows, and that excludes all other arrangements. So marriage is when a man and a woman leave father and mother and they cleave, they're glued to each other, and what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder, Matthew 19, 6. And as commonly quoted marriage vows state, marriage means forsaking all others and keeping ourselves only unto our spouses. So then that marriage bond and there alone is where conception should take place, where child rearing is a part of that home. And by having children and rearing those children in the home, it fills that home with joy and love. I thank God every day that He allowed me to have children and now grandchildren. My children are grown and gone, but grandchildren come and stay. And I had three at the house when I left today. A little five-year-old girl came in and she was a bird today and had a broken wing so I had to help her I made a little nest on the bed and and put her in it and I brought her some worms carrots but they were worms and fed her and got her back to health and she finally was able to fly by the time I was able to leave there you know that's that's a lot of fun and how much joy they've brought and do bring How blessed are the parents to have children. How blessed are the children to grow up in a home where there is purity and godliness and the parents teach them and train them, instruct them and correct them to be what they ought to be and do so in a God-ordained, God-approved, God-centered home. People want to know what is wrong today with society. There's what's wrong with it. People are forsaking God and they're not allowing him to come into their homes. Let's look at both families now. and Think about the future, and while we could talk about a lot of negative things, we want to be positive in our approach to the future. Even though there have been significant social changes that have been engineered and forced upon us in our society by evil men and women who have a determined course of action, who have through the years gradually, sometimes imperceptibly, taken over our educational system and now working through civil government, they have the upper hand, it seems. They even work through religious institutions to bring down our society and to emphasize and encourage ungodliness. Jude 4, 15, and 18 talk about ungodly men in their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed as ungodly sinners because of their ungodly lusts. And so it is today. We could look at society and become discouraged and say, what's the use? But we can't do that. Rather, let's consider some positive steps that we can take today and in days following that will ensure to the best of our ability a better future for both families, the best future. So how can we do that? We have to take seriously our responsibilities, even when the burden is heavy, the cost is high, the way is hard, the road is lonely, and it's not convenient to do so. Let's consider when the burden is heavy. You know, families take a lot of work. When I was an electrician, I'd work six days a week, did so for a long time, worked every Saturday. Then I'd work a double shift a couple of days a week. And so I was working eight days a week. And you know what? They got old and I got tired and my motivation was lacking because it seemed the way was long and the burden was heavy. And it can happen that way in our families today. The work is really regular. I was texting with a preacher friend the other day. And I said, well, some of the teachers are out, and, and I've been teaching my classes and, and also teaching some other classes and uh, handling some other things. And, and about that time, a student came in, and he said, the student who was to preach in chapel today is not going to be here. That was 821, and chapel started at 830. 
And so I grabbed a sermon outline and went to chapel and preached in chapel. And I told him, I said, you know, this is getting to be like work. <laughs> of course, I was joking. It's always like work. But sometimes it seems that work is really regular. And it gets that way in the family. And the weight of the load grows. And motivation can be a problem. And we have to remember that love motivates us. Look at Proverbs 31. You'll see that example. Here's the virtuous woman. Her price was far above rubies. What did she do? She toiled early. She toiled late. She worked in various areas of responsibility. And why did she do that? Because she loved her family and she loved her God who gave her that family. And so we read verses 27 through 31, this very complimentary description of this good woman. And notice what it says, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed and her husband also and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. When we have that kind of love for the church and for the home, we'll find the burdens will be much lighter, the way will be much brighter, and the joy will be much greater. But consider another example. Elders. Elders bear a weighty responsibility. It sometimes becomes a heavy burden. And they are often criticized and rarely complimented. I tell the brethren at Munford, Munford, Tennessee, that uh, we need to tell our elders thank you. We need to encourage them. We need to praise them when they do well. And then if there is a time when we have a concern, then that will be much better received and much better given. 1 Timothy 5, 17 shows the danger there. We need to be careful. They watch for our souls, Hebrews 13, 17. There's one, Hebrews 13, 7. Those who have the rule over you. They watch for our souls. They give an account for us. And so we ought to do what would bring them to that point and make it joy for them. It's not easy being an elder, but how very important they are. Acts 14, 23, Titus 1, 5. Elders in every church, in every city, that was God's plan. It is still God's plan, but sometimes good men refuse the work because they realize the weighty responsibility. And sometimes good men give up because the burden gets too heavy for them. And they open up a door perhaps to a diatrophies and the family of God might suffer because of that. So how can we prepare both families for the future in a positive way? Well, we have to be strong and we have to bear those burdens and help others bear their burdens, Galatians 6, 2. Philippians 4, 13, Paul wrote that he could do all things through Christ which strengthened him. Those all things refer to those things he would do in the service of Christ, to the praise of God as a Christian. He could do those things through Christ and the strength that he would have in Christ. Ephesians 6.10. And so when the burdens are heavy, we need to look for that strength. And when we handle those burdens with love, we'll find they're not burdens at all. A little over a year ago, I was in the hospital. I'd been sick for about six weeks, couldn't seem to get well. And, and eventually I got to the point where I had to go to the hospital. And my wife was telling me I'm going to call the ambulance. And I was saying, no, you're not. And then I'd pass out. And I'd wake up and she'd say, I'm going to call the ambulance. I'd say, no, you're not. And then I'd pass out. And I finally realized what I was doing. And she got me to the hospital. And when I got there, my blood sugar was 1,300. They said, we've never seen blood sugar that high. How long have you been a diabetic? And I said, I guess about 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, come to find out, I'd, the steroids I'd been taking had shot my blood sugar 
through the roof and my blood pressure was at stroke level and I told her to go on to work and uh, I'd be fine. If she had done that, I probably wouldn't be here tonight. And then the next day in the hospital, I had a blood clot that hit my lungs and it shattered and there were no alarms that went off, no doctors and nurses. And she was standing right there. And so she went and got help. And the doctor said, if you hadn't been in the hospital, you wouldn't be here. And I said, if my wife hadn't been here, I wouldn't be here. So she showed me how to uh, live. She, by her life, taught me, 1 Peter 3, what to do that I might be a Christian. And my soul was saved. And now she saved my life twice. You know what? Mother's Day is going to be really big this year. I appreciate it. And I've thanked her many, many times. And she has always said it was, you know, it wasn't anything special. She just did what she needed to do. And what she's saying is it wasn't as burdensome because of love. And I love her more now than ever. I appreciate her more. And so when we love, the burdens will be lighter and the future will be brighter and we will realize there is no burden too heavy when it comes to family. But then what about when the cost is high? The U.S. Department of Agriculture has determined that to rear a child from birth to 17 years old costs $233,160. That is in 2015 dollars, so it would be more now. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that seems a little bit low. I know, it, it does, doesn't it? But it costs a lot to have a child and to bring that child to adulthood. A parent who is aged and infirm may also require a lot. It is not unusual for a family to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars caring for a loved one. But it's because they love them. And the cost is high. But can you place a dollar amount upon a child or upon a parent or upon any family member? And so we plan and we budget and we work and we adjust and we do the best that we can to take care of those whom we love so dearly because they need that even though the cost is high. But high cost may be totally disassociated from financial assets. It may be an emotional toll that comes because of that burden. Jesus, in agony, prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground, Luke twenty two forty four. 44. You may not realize how many times the preacher may with tears pray about a problem. An immoral sister, an ungodly brother, a husband, a father who's not being what he ought to be, concerns for a lost soul or a church member who's angry, whatever the church problem might be. How many times has a loving father spent a sleepless night because of a lost boy like Luke 15? How many times have elders met and met and met and prayed and prayed and prayed and worked and worked and worked because there was something so seriously needed. Spirits were in danger. What about the wife who wants so badly for her husband to be saved, to be the husband he ought to be, to be the father that he ought to be, to be the head of the house as God designed, Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 4. So the cost may be high sometimes. And it may be too high for some, and they give up, and the future looks bleak. But again, the future will be bright when we determine that no cost is too high when it comes to family, and no burden is too heavy. But what about when the way is hard? The burdens that we're called upon to bear, the costs that we must pay, add up to making the way hard. I walk on a treadmill, and it will incline. And that makes it more difficult, requires more calories. That's why I do it. But studies have shown that it is sometimes harder to walk downhill. I believe that. 
Have you ever walked up Stone Mountain? I have. That was hard, but it was much harder walking down Stone Mountain, I can tell you. And so when we began to think that the way up is too hard, we need to realize that the way down is much harder. Proverbs 13, 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. That word hard means it's a dry, rocky, barren path, and such a path is without the comfort, without the companionship, without the compassion that the way of light offers. And sometimes when the way seems hard, a spouse bails out. A parent walks away. The preacher takes his hand off the plow. An elder resigns. What we need to do for the sake of our families is to keep our feet pointing in the right direction, keep our eyes upon the goal, keep our hearts filled with determination and courage, and keep our hopes undiminished, and then joyfully we can stride purposefully along that narrow way, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. It will be hard, but it will be the right path to take. And so with Christ, we can face every obstacle and we can overcome it. As Paul wrote, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. So for the future of both families, we need to press toward the mark. And the future will be bright. when We determine that no way is too hard. No cost is too high. And no burden is too heavy. But what about when the road is lonely? I was in Hong Kong and I was walking down the sidewalk. And I'm six feet tall and they're not quite that tall. So I could see over their heads. And it looked like a sea of humanity. The sidewalks were packed as far as you could see, hundreds, thousands of people. And I thought, I don't know a single person in Hong Kong. And not a single person knows me. And here I was in this sea of humanity, but I was alone. And the paradox is that families where togetherness is the watchword can be the loneliest places on earth. You know what? You can sit in a building with 200 people and still be alone. You can be at home in a family where the family members are so detached they hardly know each other. It is as if they were strangers and physical proximity does not necessarily diminish loneliness. There's more to a relationship than just being in the same house or being in the same building. That is the case that when we choose the right path, some will shun us. They may not understand. It may be a problem that we don't understand. There's a passive then attack upon us that results in loneliness. But you know what? God has already answered the questions that we have yet to ask. And he has shown us designing both church and home to be support groups where we find ourselves with others of like precious faith, others of the same persuasion, and where with faith, hope, and love we are united and we contribute to the functioning of that family. 1 Corinthians 12 shows that in talking about the physical body and how it works together. And then comparing that to the spiritual body, 1 Corinthians 12, 20, now are they many members, yet but one body? And so the body is to work together. And when it does, we can sing, blessed be the tie that binds. But if we find ourselves feeling lonely, instead of withdrawing into a world of self-pity, we need to reach out and form ties of mutuality. We need to look for fellowship and support. That means that we give fellowship and support 1 John 1, 7. But if it turns out that we do have to travel that road of righteousness all alone, we need to remember that God is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. 
And it is the case, there's still 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And so let us, as we consider loneliness, be aware there are others who are traveling that same road. We may not know them, but they're going the same direction. We'll see them someday. So the future of both families will be bright when we determine there is no road that is too lonely, there is no way that is too hard, there is no cost that is too high, there is no burden that is too heavy, and we're going to keep traveling that right path even when it's not convenient. Inconvenience is an excuse that we sometimes may use without even realizing we've surrendered ourselves to that. We know the classic biblical example of the Roman procurator Felix, and when Paul reasoned with him of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered and said, Go thy way, for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee, Acts 24, 25. And as far as we know, that convenient season never came. It's not always convenient. Sometimes husbands and fathers find it inconvenient to be husbands and fathers, to rear their children, Ephesians 6, 4, as God commanded, to cherish their wives, Ephesians 5, as God commanded. And so they miss ball games, and they're not there for the concert. And when the award ceremony is going on, they're someplace else. They stand up their wives, their absentees in the family, and there's going to be a day when it is impossible to remove or to resolve that deep, deep regret. If that's where you are today, you need to get on your knees and ask for forgiveness from God and from your family and begin today to be what you ought to be. It's not always convenient to be in a family. But the problem is not the family. That's the blessing. When our hearts are pulled in two ways, like Matthew 6, 24, the root of the problem then is that we have a a selfishness instead of a selflessness. It may not be convenient to care for that child, to be in that responsible position may not be convenient to care for that spouse or that parent. But you know what? Love trumps inconvenience. It may not be convenient to nurture that young Christian to listen to a broken-hearted sister, to bear with long-suffering that brother who is struggling and is weak. But you know what? Love trumps inconvenience. The future will be bright for both families when there is no inconvenience that is too great, no road too lonely, no way too hard, no cost too high, and no burden too heavy. If we want to ensure the best future for the church and the home, we have to take seriously our responsibilities. Alone, No one person can secure that desirable future for the church or for the home. But when each of us determines that we're going to do our part, together we can work to bring about a bright future, the future God desires for us, the future that we want and that we can have. But it takes all of us working together. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, as we've already determined, the body is made up of those who are saved. You're not saved. And so the first thing you need to do is to come to Jesus and from Him receive that blessing of salvation, Ephesians 1, 7. And when you come to Him believing in Him, you'll want to repent, to turn from all your past sins, to change your mind and change your life. And you'll be willing to make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the one that He claims He is. And then to be buried with him in baptism, Romans 6, 3, from that watery grave to arise and walk in newness of life, verse 4, there having obtained that cleansing by his precious blood, Revelation 1, 5, and he'll add you to his church, the family of God. And you can begin to work 
in that family to help it to be what it ought to be. You can begin as a member of that home, whatever your membership part might be, to help that home to be what it ought to be. You see, if everybody else in the home is living right and you're not, that home will never be what it could be. Surely you love those in your home. You want to help them to have a bright future, but surely you love God and Jesus Christ who died for you, and you want to help His body, the church, to have a bright future. If you've not obeyed the gospel, now's the time to do it. We'll be glad to help you. It'll take but a few moments. If you've done that and you straight away and gone back to the world, it's time to come back and to get back where you need to be in serving the Lord faithfully, not selfish but selfless, and helping others to know that bright future as well. If that's your need, we'll be glad to pray with you and pray for you. But whatever your need might be, we encourage you to come while we stand and while we sing.